Today, we are going to be looking at how British American War of Independence coats have changed over the past 50 years. So today I'm going to be comparing the coat that I first uh, was wearing when I got into the AWI hobby, which is from about the 1970s, and then I'll be comparing it to my newer coat, uh, which is from uh, just this past year, which is made out of more uh, documented materials and is, for all intents and purposes, as close to a facsimile of an 18th century coat as possible. There are different reasons uh, why changes have been made from accessibility to materials and more documentation. So for certain things, it kind of depends on what the reason is of why this coat might not be up to snuff to a modern standard, but we'll kind of go through some of those things as we compare the two coats. One thing I would like everyone to keep in mind as we're going through these two coats is that this coat, as I might be critiquing some of its things, well, I'm doing that, this coat was actually one of the best garments uh, in the period uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s as the other reenactors who were reenacting British in that period um, were less than ideal as they were wearing things like bathrobes for coats and paper mache grenadier miter caps. So well, this might not be up to, again, uh, our modern snuff. This uh, was a great garment and was light years ahead of anything else that was going on in the period. So when coats like this arrived on the scene, this very much was the most progressive coat that someone could have, as this kind of was the beginning of progressivism in the AWI hobby. The hobby itself has evolved quite a bit in the past 50 years. It's gone from a much more ceremonial institution in the 1970s to being much more like what the army would have been historically uh, in the period, with a lot more interpretation based upon the actual period and from primary source documents which more and more have come out over the past 50 years. And that's a good thing, as when you're portraying uh, the, the army even more accurately and more akin to what it would have been like in the period, it helps break some of the myths and the public perception of what a British soldier would have been like in the period. So before I rant a little too much here, why don't we look at the two coats and we can kind of see how the hobby has advanced in the past 50 years, eh? Now it's slightly hard to show these two coats, so I'll be using a lot of B-roll, but one of the first things you'll notice about the two coats is that they drape a little bit differently, and that is due to the fabric that they use. My initial coat from the 1970s is actually made out of flannel, a uh, woolen flannel. So that's pretty similar to what you might find in your regular winter shirt, um, though most of those are cotton, but it's the same kind of fabric. And the new coat I have here is made out of broadcloth, which is the period appropriate cloth. And so this is exactly what a coat of the period would have been made out of. It would have made out of this uh, broadcloth, which is, um, there's nothing really modern that's kind of made with cloth like this. Um, so the best way I can kind of describe it is something that's made out of serge. So you might know what serge is. And it's kind of like that, not really, but it's significantly thicker. Whereas flannel is a much thinner fabric which you're probably kind of familiar with. So the best way to kind of describe it to you is that this broadcloth in this in this uh, facsimile coat is probably like three times the thickness of say your flannel shirt at home. So that kind of gives you the idea that this cloth is a lot thicker and much more durable than say this coat. Though this coat is old and is lost and quite fine, though it is getting a little sad at this point. Now on closer inspection, when you look at this coat versus the old coat from the 1970s, on the 70s coat, you'll actually see the weave because it's flannel. But on the broadcloth coat, you'll notice that you don't see the weave because it has this nap, which is very common of period fabrics. And so the coat actually almost looks like it's felt, but that is just the nap of the uh, broadcloth itself. So once this starts to wear down, you'll actually start to see the weave in the grains of the fabric itself. Now, what was the reason for not using broadcloth in the 1970s? Well, from talking to people and looking at the founder of the 10th Regiment of Foot's founder, Vinny, uh, it seems like the biggest reason for it is that broadcloth was more expensive and less accessible back then. Whereas you could find this flannel stuff anywhere and you could make sure that you had this in the same fabric for everyone's coat, thus having a consistent product throughout the entire regiment. And it also seems from hearsay talking to people that 
Also, he was afraid that people would not want to wear a, a thick wool like this because they're used to wearing these polyester suits in the 1970s, and they'd be like, what is this? What is this, this, this made out of? It's so thick. So uh, it seems like with those reasons in mind, that's why they went with this flannel fabric. Is it true? I don't know, but that's what the 1970s documentation seems to uh, make me believe. So one thing I failed to mention when making the main cut of this video in regards to cloth is that the edges on the old coat are also turned and not cut. And because the fabric is flannel and not the proper broadcloth, it will not hold a raw edge. And raw edges are common in this period because the fabric is of good enough quality that it will not fray when it is just cut and left on the edge of a garment. And that changes the look of the garment a little bit too. They did know about this in the 1970s, but with the flannel that they were using, that was not possible as the flannel will just fray like there's no tomorrow. So now that we've taken a look at the outside cloth of the coat, why don't we take a look at the inside of the coat? So if we take a look at the modern coat here, you'll notice that it has this very, very uh, coarse fabric that almost looks like a burlap bag. And this is called baize and this is what the coat is lined with. It is quite a distinctive fabric and it actually sucks working with it because it likes to fray like there is no tomorrow. But when it's inside of a coat, it looks really nice. And when we compare that to the old coat from the 1970s, we'll see that this is lined with a serge. No, it's not a serge. <laughs> That's what a sergeant's coat is lined with. I messed up. This is lined with flannel. And again, that's what the coat is made out of, but this is incorrect to modern standards. Though the way this coat is, it would probably fray just as much as this uh, baize here. So a little bit of a difference. And while we're here, why don't we take a look at the hearts? You'll notice that on this modern coat here, we have uh, some small hearts. And on the old coat, we have some slightly larger hearts, though this isn't too terrible. On certain bicentennial coats, you actually see hearts that are even bigger but in the artwork that does show hearts, they tend to be uh, smaller. Now they're not written down anywhere to be in anything. It, they just pop up in artwork and they're actually kind of nice as they do add a little bit to the back of the tails um, and they don't look so plain. So I think it's a good little feature, but they shouldn't be massive as most pieces of artwork show them with smaller hearts. And these really aren't that far off. I honestly would say that these are probably within the realm of what's uh, you can kind of see in artwork. Now the buttons on the two coats are slightly different too. So these original ones are cast on what an original button looks like and these ones are made to actually what the original buttons are like too. They're just two kind of variations of period buttons. So in the 70s they did know about the original 10th button that was found uh, up in Michigan. Um, and so they made this little button and then they stamped the 10 in, which is exactly how they did it back then as well on the 10th buttons. And on these modern ones, they are cast just like what the original button looks like, except the 10 is cast in, which actually isn't what they did. It was um, stamped in. So, but these are more accurate as there are more dome and little mushroom shaped button versus a disc, a little Starship Enterprise disc there. So this is a little more accurate uh, than these as they look a little better, um, but these are made kind of in a period way. So that's kind of cool, but this is kind of the way to go as they look a little closer to what the original buttons look like. Alongside that, another difference is how the buttons are affixed. On this new coat here, they're actually corded on. And what happens is you put a hole through the fabric and you put the button through, and then you literally put a piece of cording to, to secure the button so that it doesn't come off. Versus on these, these are actually cotter pinned on. So they stick them through the fabric and they just stick a cotter pin in. And they have a real tendency to mar up the coat and slightly ruin it and they rust. And the biggest reason for that seems to be to take them off to polish them. I am assuming is the, is the reason behind it. Though I'm doing more research with a few of my friends to see how much they actually polished buttons, as it seems that, at least from reading some orderly books, they were more uh, uh, concerned with the care of the accoutrements versus the buttons. So, not sure, but either way, um, in the period, they wouldn't have had cotter pins. They would have just been corded onto the coat. So, 
that's that's how that is and doing it in the proper way is also good too because then you can have real buttonholes and the coat can actually close like it is supposed to so it's functional and when it's cold you just close it up and suddenly you're a little bit warmer at least in theory and so the lack of buttonholes on the front lapels is one of the bigger uh, differences in the two coats as well it makes the coat much more functional and again kind of alludes to that more it's not a ceremonial we're actually going to more functional garments and things that are facsimiles of what they would have been to the best of our uh, research and interpreting the army uh, much more accurately so one more thing i'd like to add is that my new coat is from a henry cook coat kit that he cut out for me and my friend ian graves of royal blue traders kind of pushed me along to finish it because with no reenacting happening i kind of just didn't do it i totally procrastinated probably mostly because a coat is a huge and gargantuan task when you have no familiarity with it so he kind of pushed me along to get this thing done and helped me quite significantly and you definitely learn quite a bit from it so thank you to ian for doing that for me i appreciate it quite profusely and if you, the viewer, are looking for any sort of 18th century clothing, military or civilian, I encourage you to check the two of them out, and I will link them somewhere down below. And sometime in the near future, we will take a look at the sergeant's coat that Ian made for me uh, last year. Anyway, back to the video. And that's pretty much it for the differences between the two coats. As you can see, it's nothing drastic. The coats look pretty similar. Really what's changed over the past 50 years is the materials that coats are made out of and their functionality. And I think that speaks to the general trend of the hobby and the overall evolutions of it itself. It very much speaks to that change of ceremony to we're very much trying to appear as the British Army did in our instance, April 19th, 1775. So I hope this video was slightly enjoyable and you learned something new at some level. Maybe not, but who cares? So thanks for watching and see you on the field.